The, the long, strange trip with Bill Walton. <laughs> hey, here we go. Cleveland, <laughs> rock and roll. LeBron James, little Sean. Yeah, Channing, where'd he go tonight? Richard Jefferson, our fifth son. Richard, what a great thing to see you so happy. The world champion, playing in these sellout crowds every single night. The traveling circus at the Cleveland Cavaliers. Let's go. Nothing is better for an old guy like me, old and in the way, 64, to see one of his children come and just do so well, to wear that championship ring, to have his two children, and to be out there with LeBron and Kyrie and T. Luby and the coach, and it's just so fantastic, and these fans here oh my gosh i have been so lucky rj to be on some of the great teams in basketball history so i know how much fun you're having and yes. i can just see it in your face and you've just done so magnificently well and i can remember i can remember this moment in my life when <laughs> luke was a a senior in high in high school and he came home from his first recruiting trip ever he had other trips scheduled, one to UCLA, and I think Kansas, and Kentucky, and Duke, and he comes home from his very first trip, which was to Tucson, Arizona, and I picked him up at the airport, and he got off the plane, and he said, Dad, you know, I had these other four trips scheduled to all these other schools. I said, yeah? He said, cancel them, Dad, <laughs> because, <laughs> because when I went to Tucson, I met this guy. And his name was Richard Jefferson, Dad. Oh, and boy. <laughs> that's what I want to do with the rest of my life. I want to spend the rest of my life with Richard. <laughs> and I want to be on a special team. And this guy, Richard, is from Phoenix. And, Dad, I know we're from San Diego. And, Dad, I know how you always talk about Arizona and everything in the Grand Canyon State. And I know how much you love Lute Olson. But, Dad, I really love Richard Jefferson. <laughs> And it was so fantastic. And then you became part of the family, and yes. all the other Wildcats would come over. And then the time, oh, it was so fantastic. Because then you moved on, and yeah. you became one of the $100 million players out of the Wildcat program. And here you all were with all the different guys coming in, and Gilbert Arenas and, and uh, Damon Stoudemire and all the different guys in the history of that program. I mean, the Arizona Wildcats, that program, the guys who graduated from there and gone on to the NBA, you guys have combined to make more than $1.2 billion wow. Wow. in the course of your career. So, But regardless of that, you would all come back to San Diego, to our house in <laughs> yes, San Diego sir. in the summertime, <laughs> yes. and you'd be there. And we had beds everywhere. So Lori and I would wake up in the morning. I'm a lot earlier riser than Lori is. I mean, <laughs> if she's up by noon, we're really lucky, right? So Lori would come out of the out of the bedroom in the back there in the late, late morning, and she'd see all you guys just lying around on the floor <laughs> out there in the couches and in the beds. And she'd look around and said, you, you're making $100 million in the NBA. You're making $70 million. You're making $30 million. You know, come on, how about getting a hotel? How about buying your own house? And then you went and you did buy your own then house. Then we bought our own <laughs> house. And it was fantastic. And you bought that place in Rancho Santa Fe. And I remember to this moment, it was so clear, we we sat there on the veranda at the Rancho Santa Fe Inn. We tried to talk you out of it. <laughs> and you guys said, no, we're going to do this, Dad. And so you bought this beautiful estate with fences and everything around it, a big pool. We put in a great garden. And it was just so much fun. And I remember you had a teepee there. Yes, we had a teepee. And, had, and, and then, so we asked you, like, what was the, what was the plan? What was the goal? <laughs> And you and Luke looked at us in unison, and you said, our goal is to make this house the Playboy Mansion. Oh, <laughs> man. And you did, and you succeeded. <laughs> and it was over the top. You haven't heard this story no. I know. Oh, so, I love it. And so we would always get these you know, we'd always get these calls. We'd always get these messages <laughs> from other people. Oh, man, did you hear that Luke and Richard are having a party? I said, well, and I'd say, well, when is it? And they would say, oh, it's like Labor Day, and it's an all-white party, whatever that means, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I'm a deadhead. I mean, we go to parties like we go where we go everywhere else. We got our jeans on and we got our T-shirts on, right? And so I would call up Luke and Richard and I'd say, well, hey, man, I hear you're having a party. What time does it start? So, 1 o'clock. Uh, but you know what, Dad? They would, you know, they would tell me on the phone. They would say, this is not really the kind of party <laughs> that parents come to. Uh, you know when, you're, when your so parents want to tell stories and, these, oh, and, and, and they God. kind of embarrass you. I did, I did not know that 
all of the uh, dozens of listeners we have out there would get to hear about me and Luke trying to have a Playboy South type party. Oh, you succeeded. It was incredible. <laughs> the messages that I've received over the years. And, and I come across these one young, wonderful angels here like like Allie. And, oh, thank you. And, 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 and I'll come across them, and, and they'll say, oh, man, I've been to your house. <laughs> I've been to your teepee. I say, oh, who are you? And they say, oh, I know Luke. I know Richard. I said, oh, my gosh. I've heard all about this teepee. Too. Oh, it's fantastic. So we've all tried to duplicate the teepee. Bill right. had the original teepee. And so, like he said, he had built beds spread out all around his house. So when all of us were in college, we would just go and crash there. Uh, and so what would happen was, is like, whoever didn't get to a room first ended up having to go crash on the bed. So you would sleep on a bed in the living room. But there'd be beds outside, outside and yes, it was, on the it was, deck. Yeah. There's multiple beds outside, and if you couldn't get to one of those beds, you tried to get to the TP first because the TP at least was closed. It would block yeah. you in from the sun a little bit. So one of the coolest things of my life as a dad is that we got to go, Lori and I, we got to go to Luke's first game as head coach of the Lakers this year. And what a thrill. And there's nothing like the pride of a dad. And so, you know, Luke signs a very nice contract to be the coach. He made a lot of money in the NBA as a player. And just, you know, he's, he's doing really, really well. And so I asked Luke in a, in, in a quiet moment, I said, so Luke, you know, you've been living in this house in Manhattan Beach for nine and a half years with the Lakers, beautiful house there, but are, are you thinking about moving up? You're thinking about getting a bigger place. You've got more children now. you got Lawson and Landon and Bree, his wife, just fantastic. And he looked at me and then looked at Lori and put a big smile on his face. And he said, you know what, Dad? <laughs> There's only one 1010 Myrtle Way, yeah. which is our address. <laughs> yeah, and address. It was a fa- it's a fa- we still live there. It's yeah. a fantastic place, and we've been there 38 years now. And how old are you now, Richard? Uh, you must I'm, be 37 yeah, now, right? Yeah, thir- I'm 37. The funny thing is, like, so I remember my first – our uh, – uh, our our freshman year, right. uh, you called and was like, Luke, uh, I need you to send uh, – coach called and said there's documents, and so I need you to send them to 1010 Myrtle Way, San Diego, California, 92103. 92103. I'm giving you, away my home address <laughs> on your podcast. And That's the dumbest well, half thing of, I've ever done. Half of San Diego has been there. Me and Luke right. used to take everybody there. So then you say it again, and I looked to Luke, and I was like, Luke, like, did you just move or something? And he was like, why? I was like – well, your dad left the address twice. He was like, Richard, Bill's a little different. I, I was born in the downstairs bedroom of that house, and every time he calls, he leaves either his phone number twice or the address twice. Don't worry, Richard. You'll figure it out sooner or later. But how much fun was it to go and watch you guys play? Because what Lute Olson did for that program, for the Conference of Champions, for you, all, all of you individuals, I mean, you, you're coming up and you got this – brilliant coach who knows how to build teams and you know that's what I see right here now and to see these Cavaliers playing at the level and I'm a warrior of the Golden State and last year during the championship you were there in game seven I was there five five and seven I was there for I think one five and seven and I was sure Golden State was going to win. I mean, are you kidding me? Yeah. And then Draymond Green loses his mind and puts himself ahead of the team. And then all of a sudden, I mean, I gave up a Bob Dylan concert to go to game five. No way. Oh. At Humphreys. Oh. What am I thinking? Humphreys is this fantastic venue right on the water in San Diego with the mountains behind it and the ocean <coughs> right there. And the moon was out and Bob Dylan was going to be there. And like, uh, But we had to go to the game because we were sure that the Warriors were going to win. And then Draymond loses loses his mind, and Cleveland plays fantastic. The Warriors totally fall apart, and you guys become the best team. And when when you win those championships, and, and it changes your life, it and does. it changes the franchise, it changes the culture and the, and the confidence that you have. And to see the way that LeBron is playing right now, uh, 15 years ago, I came here to Cleveland. The game was at Cleveland State when LeBron was in high school, and it was just incredible to see what – skill level he had as a 17-year-old player. Now, Kareem at that level, you know, Wilt at that age and same stage, and, and Oscar at that same, Sabonis at that stage in their career, they were magnificent. And then now LeBron has just taken that and what he's been able to do in terms of establishing a legacy, but more important, to build a future for himself and to see how it spreads around. And now you've got all these players and the vision at the top for the franchise to, to put the complementary players around. And I, and I know you've been on some remarkable franchises there. 
there. You know, you're it's down in San Antonio yeah. and in, in New Jersey when they were on top. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when New Jersey was a good team. And so, you know, <laughs> that was my first couple of years. Right. Yeah. And you were in the finals every yeah. year, yeah. right? And you yeah. just kept looking at Luke and saying, Luke, you, you know, you're like a loser. You're on the Lakers here, right? Yeah. You were rubbing it in. And the, then he and won then, two championships right. and then three with and, the Golden State. And now you have one. Yeah. And the chance to get it done. And that, and that, that opportunity, the privilege, the honor to repeat and that challenge. And with Golden State adding KD and what a brilliant move that was. And that franchise just on fire right now. But you guys have a chance because you have LeBron and nobody else does. And the years that we were able to win the championship with Portland, we had Maurice Lucas and nobody else did in Boston. We had Larry Bird, and nobody (laughs) else did. And you have LeBron, and nobody else does. And so stay healthy, keep the team spirit, keep the skill level high, and then the freshness. The freshness that you, I mean, how many, this is your 14th? 16th season. 16th year, man. Don't cut him short. I am so (laughs) jealous. I mean, I'm the most injured player ever. I missed nine and a half full seasons of my NBA career. And so uh, to see how it's all come together, to see the happiness and the joy. I was down at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame today to see all my guys, and it was just so special. What a magical place. You know, I came in here grumpy as can be, (laughs) flying all the way across the country. Everybody on the plane had the plague. And, you know, I'm battling pneumonia here, and I get here, and it's like, oh, my gosh, what's happening? You know, I read the news. I stay up on all this stuff, and I'm thinking, Ohio? What am I going to Ohio for, man? All they have there is carnage and crime and refugees. (laughs) (laughs) and and immigrants and 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 regulations and terrorists and i said what am i going to do and then i get here and it's like fantastic and everybody's happy and wonderfully joyous and uh, the airport looks terrific the hotel downtown and the mall and the restaurants and i come to the go to the hall of fame on the water and the pyramid down there reminded me of our trip to egypt with the grateful dead and said and all of a sudden i come into the arena tonight and everybody's just celebrating and then lebron just turns it on i mean he's like mozart he's like the conductor he's like Gustav Mahler <laughs> and it's just just does whatever he wants and those are good players out there. Good players. <laughs> those are really good players. Paul George is tremendous. And all the different things they've got going for him over there. And LeBron, and he just treats everybody like a little child out there. <laughs> and to see, to see how far he's come, to see how far you've grown, we are so proud. We are so <laughs> lucky. Thank we are you, so Bill. happy to be a part of of something like the NBA. You know, the NBA has changed all of our lives. More importantly, though, the NBA has changed the world. And what the NBA stands for and represents, inclusion and opportunity, that's what life is all about. And to to be able to take this message out and for the rest of my life, I'll be always able to tell myself as I'm on my bike and I'm on the long, hard climb, as I'm sitting there looking at the beautiful sunrise, as I'm checking out the clouds as the sun leaves us in San Diego in this red sky, I'll be able to look back and say, man, remember that day 15 years ago in 2002 when LeBron was 17? I was there. I was a witness. Remember that day in 2000? What year are we in now? 17? 17. Oh, and LeBron's 32. 14 years later in the NBA, I'll be able to say, wow, I was there. And I was there when Richard Jefferson was there, too. And how fantastic. And then <laughs> little Sean, the Channing Fry coming in. And now how he's such a great star. And it's just fantastic. And when we had the chance, you and I, Richard, to talk before the game, and and. You were mentioning how what an honor and privilege it is to be LeBron's backup. Yeah. But there's all, that's also a challenge. Responsibility. And a, a responsibility and a duty and an obligation. And you've got to push him, but not too hard because he's playing big minutes and you've got to let him get his rest. But your professional responsibility to bring it every night, even though you're going to play limited minutes behind LeBron, that's all cool. But when you come in and you're able to go out there and get the job done, either keep it going as the sixth man or change the direction of the team. And it was the same job that, that Scotty Wedman had, a great teammate of ours on the Celtics when Larry Bird was the LeBron James of his day. And so here it was. Scotty would work so hard. Scotty and I are exactly the same age. College class of 1974, four years in those days, everybody went. And so here it was, Scotty would just be so primed. And, so ready, and he was one of just a handful of the greatest shooters in the entire league. And there would be games, and when Scotty would play, just a couple of minutes, or he'd play more minutes in 
addition in, in the same time and same combination as Larry. And Scotty was so good that there was days when he was the second best player in the entire world. Larry would always be the first. Because even Larry, at just an average day, Larry, Larry was just so far ahead and better than everybody else. Three times in a row, MVP. That's only been done by two other guys. And that was Wilt and Bill Russell. And it's so much harder from the forward position, which has been your position. I mean, forward is the hardest position in all of basketball to dominate. from. But Larry was able to do that. Now LeBron, but LeBron defies position. I mean, he's just one of those unique forces of nature and just so powerful. But more importantly for LeBron is how he's worked on his skill. But to me, as great a basketball player he is, he is his stuff off the court is uh, so far eclipses everything he's done yeah. on the basketball court. He's, he's his, his philanthropy, teammate. his business acumen, his sense of, of, of humanity, his ethics, his, his courage, his, his, moral, his moral clarity, and also his sacrifice. Because, you know, he could just come out there and be a jerk. He could come out there and treat everybody like, what are you bothering me for? I'm LeBron James. But he looks around and says, hey, how can I be the human forklift? How can I lift people and things up and put them in a better place? And that's what he's done, to be able to come back to his hometown after learning. Learning from Pat Riley about what it takes to be the champion. You know, because LeBron, he did not have the greatest childhood growing up. And he did not have the greatest culture when he first joined this franchise. This franchise, I mean, this was, this was a franchise in transition. And they had an ownership change. And then Dan Gilbert comes in. And the first thing he does is fire Paul Silas, who I thought was an excellent coach for LeBron. Because the coach, the coach he has to be able to tell the young guys no. And when the coach, the leader... When the guy on the top, when he can look around to all the young guys who want so much, when he, when he can say no and everybody else still buys in. I mean, that was John Wooden. That was Red Auerbach. That was Jack Ramsey. That was David Stern. And now that's what's happened here. Because when Le- LeBron got down to Miami, there was Pat Riley saying, look, this is the way you're going to do it. And so then Pat takes LeBron to this incredible level and LeBron says, yeah, okay, now I got it. And now he comes back here to Cleveland, and it's yeah. just happening. And the crowd just so fun, so happy, and so confident. And that's the true sign of a great team, a great franchise, and a spectacular player. When you know before the game starts <laughs> that you're going to win, because at the end of the day, you have LeBron. <laughs> and nobody else does. And I want to ask you about that, because LeBron just Hi, said... Hi, what's your name again? I'm Allie. Allie. Hi, I'm, <laughs> I'm Allie. I'm Rafa. I'm Allie. How are you? Again, just a reminder. Yeah. I want to ask you about I that. I love Rastafarian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spark it up. Yeah. Stoke. Oh, my god. I want to ask you about that, because LeBron said... your question? Said, yeah. LeBron said the other day that no matter who's injured, who's in the, in the lineup, who's not, right. he's on the floor, the team has a chance. Absolutely. So what is it you see for our listeners, the reason why we're so lucky to be uh, graced by Bill Wallen here on our no, podcast... No, no, We're lucky to be in LeBron James' be- world. <laughs> Amen. Is because um, he That's called- Richard how lucky he thinks he is. <laughs> so lucky. You were on some bad teams out there, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, how many... 16 years? <laughs> how many teams? Ah, you know, uh, this is I've my sixth track. team. Sixth team. You were in San Antonio. Yes, Popovich I was in San Antonio. Was, <laughs> that didn't work out so well. Didn't work out so well. Yeah. Where uh, else were you? You were I was in Utah, Utah, right? I was in Utah. I was in Golden State. <laughs> what was that like? Oh, man. I was in Milwaukee. Was okay. I went like? to Milwaukee, Bill. <laughs> oh, I went to, my I was gosh. Kareem spent six years there. Yeah, he won a championship. Good yeah. for him. So, Carl Malone goes to Utah, right? <laughs> and so, Carl, he, he gets there. And like he's looking around. Saying, no, Carl's from Louisiana, right? So maybe Utah is like a step up. I don't know. Yeah. And so I love all things Utah. It's fantastic. And so Miss Idaho, Miss Idaho is in Salt Lake City doing a a promotion. Yeah. And on that was the same day that Carl Malone, nicknamed the Mailman, is being introduced to the, all the folks when he first joins the NBA in Utah, right? Yeah. And so. This lady, Miss Idaho, was off on the perimeter, right? And they're having a big parade and a big celebration and a big rally. And, and, and then Miss Idaho, she, ter- you know, she turns to her friends in her group and she said, well, what's going on over there? Why is that big crowd there? Uh, and, and, and they said, well, oh, they're honoring the mailman. And she looks over and says, oh, how cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> they, they got a black mailman here in Salt Lake City <laughs> here. How, how wonderful. <laughs> and so Miss Idaho ends up ma- marrying 
Carl Malone. Oh wow, and it Black was History just, Month. It's everybody. just a fantastic story. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yes, no. She and, and what an angel she is. And they have tons of children. And they moved back down to Arkansas. And but let's talk about LeBron and what he has done in terms of the business acumen and to be able to uh, to, to start all his own agencies and to, to generate the television programs and products and you know here's a guy lebron james you take any athlete in the world today there is nobody at lebron's level in terms of the impact on the entertainment industry he's the world champion he's the finals mvp currently he'll go down as one of the one of the greatest players in the history of basketball but what he's doing he, he has joined already the ranks of roger staubach who is the platinum thorium standard there at the business level of a ex of a of a former player magic johnson up there uh, joe montana all these guys steve young who have just used their sport and their connections and their brains to build a whole business empire and he will be the standard now michael jordan has done the same thing but 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 michael has been different michael was the first in in the world of basketball magic's done absolutely phenomenal but now lebron is is just taking it over in the springboard and for all the people who were part of this podcast out here besides just the three of us are there more people out there than or is it Channing. just us Chan- Channing's a part Channing, of it. I don't see him in yeah, here but Channing, but you, we, we, the he's not a quitter all, he? no he's not a quitter no. but all the all okay. the guys join on Kyrie's been on three times really? LeBron's been on LeBron. here so now there's got- no evidence <laughs> there's no evidence that Channing Fry is a quitter <laughs> but if you were looking for evidence, this would be exhibited. He's not here. here. He's I not even a, here. It's I have a show. question for you. Uh, Rafa, you know. you're on the show too. <laughs> yes. The fans want to know. Rastafarians, yes. Is this was, a live was, show or is no, this? No, no, oh. just recording. Was Jerry Garcia a sports fan? Oh, absolutely. It's a trem- he was a, a physical fitness fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> he, just, he, he loved it. He loved to go to bed early and then get up and go right to the gym and yeah. ride the bike and Aww. do his calisthenics, do his yoga. He was fantastic. And in between all the non-filtered camel cigarettes, man, he was just really <laughs> on top of it. Aww. But to see, I was down at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this morning, and, and they brought out four of Jerry's old guitars. And I was Ooh. just sitting there looking at him. You can't touch him down there because June, who's in charge of the vault, down <laughs> locked away in the basement he pulled out four of these guitars and i was just thinking i was just dreaming and how, how perfect that was and, and and being on tour with the dead and how just how happy everybody was and that same sense of happiness tonight with these phenomenal fans and what lebron has done for the last six years of the nba where he has taken his team to the finals wherever he's been six straight years now it helps that he's in the eastern conference which is not as good a conference as the west more talent more strong teams but hey that's not lebron's fault he's doing his job <laughs> he's at right? home so but the key the key in life is to make other people happy jerry did that bob dylan makes that happen Magic makes that happen. Now LeBron's making it happen. And, and please and please read Sam Smith's book about Michael Jordan because Friday the 17th is going to be, today's the 15th. Friday the 17th is Michael Jordan's 54th birthday. Wow. And as time goes on, you know, everybody's always thinking about now. Everybody's thinking about today. But Sam Smith, this legendary writer, he writes this book called Michael Jordan, The Legacy. There is no next. And so while we're always looking for what's next, Michael set the standard. Because when you look at the history of basketball and, and, and the great players who are the foundational pillars of perfection, Bill Russell, my favorite player ever, Wilt, <laughs> the most incredible. Of, and then Oscar, absolutely spectacular. Kareem, the greatest player I ever played against. Larry Bird, the greatest player I ever played with. Magic and Michael Jordan. And so Sam, he makes this argument that what Michael was able to do on and off the court in terms of changing the perception of everything. Now, for me, when you're talking about the greatest ever, I always try to look for standards and metrics because everything else is just an opinion, and everybody can have their own opinion. So if you're going to have standards and opinions and, 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 and base it on facts and science, Bill Russell, the greatest winner of them all. I mean, he's got 11 championships in 13 years, 11 and 1 in the finals, 10 and 0 in seventh games in the course of his career. Kareem has all the records. You know, he has the scoring record. He's third all time in rebounding. He's got the most MVPs. You know, he, that guy has done it. And then, but Sam makes the article, the argument that 
things changed with Michael Jordan and the economic power that Michael brought to the league. And Michael was super fortunate in that he was not alone because nobody makes it to the top of the of the mountain alone in life. It's all about the team. It's all about the people who were around you. We see that with the Cavaliers right now and what RJ is doing, what Channing Frye is doing, what Cal- Calvin or Kyle Korver is doing, what Kyrie Irving, uh, Tristan Thompson, and when Kevin gets back and how tremendous he is. But here's this situation that Michael the simple twist of fate in life. Here he is in the early 80s. He's down there playing in North Carolina. And the world of basketball belongs to Kareem, Dr. J, Magic, and Larry. And then Michael comes along and he brings David Falk with him. At the same time, Jerry Buss is taking over the Lakers. At the same time, David Stern is becoming the commissioner of the NBA. At the same time, Phil Knight out in Oregon is opening up Nike to the rest of the world. At the same time, ESPN is starting to take over. So you have all these six different forces coming together at the same time, and there's Michael Jordan, the guy who can deliver the message, the guy who can be out there and just come every day with this level of perfection on and off the court, and everybody loved him. And now, that's LeBron James. And so, just keep going, keep keep putting smiles on people's faces, and he's so lucky. He works very, very hard at it, but so much of your health in life is based on luck. And so... Here it is that LeBron James is able to play every game. I mean, he sprained his ankle. He's a horrific sprain during the game. And he's lying there about, he's like looking for the stretcher, right? He, he his gets shoe. up, tied his shoe, <laughs> pounded his foot on the court, went and sat down for a couple minutes, and then came back and was better than ever. I mean, what a player. What a force of nature. What a dynamo. What a volcanic explosion we've been able to witness right here. I need to go back to the pyramid and just, man, lay underneath those guitars. What is is it? this a 24-7 show or what? Yeah. What, is it? What, what is it about him that makes him, that sets him apart? What's the one difference that has him way up here as you're talking about? What separates all great champions is mental acuity and emotional commitment. How smart you are And does it matter to you? Do you care? And he clearly has that. (laughs) And and he works so hard. And and nobody sees that. You know, they they see him come out and perform. But, Richard, you're there every day in practice. And uh, there's never been a great player without a great coach. And there's never been a great player who didn't just work at it he's night hard, he's, and day. I mean, he's his, the hardest worker I've been his, around. His, his level of physical fitness, his level of skill, his level of passion. And, I mean, there were really, really good players out there on the court tonight. And he made everybody else look like they were in, like, <laughs> middle school. I mean, it was like, wow. Well, Bill, Bill let me stop you because I know you're ama- – Bill, I, I just I don't want to keep you. you got places to go. And they got 24-hour room service at the hotel. <laughs> and you've learned Ohio's and, not such a bad and, place. And, and they do it – you know, they do it right over there at, at that Ritz Carlton. They I mean, do. It's very nice. It's quiet. It's, it's secure. Quiet. And they have great service. And like all Ritz Carltons, they honor the do not disturb sign. <laughs> <laughs> he has told us his address to his home yes, and yes. where he stays on the road. There we go. Well, Bill, thank you for joining us. So I'm, on on that point right there. <laughs> we are not done. We, we do a show one time. We're doing a, 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 a big corporate speech. And in, it's in, in Los Angeles at Staples Center. And it's a whole day of speakers. I mean, it's all the big boys. I mean, it's Colin Powell. It's Terry Bradshaw. It's Joe Montana. And on and on and on. 25,000 people in Staples Center just for speakers. No concerts, no games, just speakers on the stage. And the closing show, the closing segment is... John Wooden and me, oh, wow. right? And so we're up there on the stage, and we're sitting there. It's just a couple of potted plants, a table with a bottle of water on it, and Coach Wooden and I sitting there, and we are going back and forth. And we are just arguing and fighting and telling stories and laughing and crying and joking and dreaming, and it's just absolutely fantastic. You can't see a thing because the spotlights are just right in your face, but we know that there's 25,000 fans out there. They've been there all day, right? But they're just hanging on every single word, and Coach Wooden is making no sense whatsoever, right? So <laughs> so I call him out on it. I say, Coach, you can't possibly believe what you just said, and he's back in my face. Well, you're just stupid. You're a slow learner. <laughs> Come on, man. 
You'll never learn what you don't want to know. And so finally, I just lose it. And I said, come on, you folks out there, 25,000, I know you're all out there. You can't agree with what he's saying out there. So just please give him a call, right? And so I say, his number is 818-343-2266. And he looked at me, oh, my gosh. The only time he was ever mad was when I was arrested at the peace rally. Oh, man. We were trying to spread flowers and love and happiness and joy. And there it was, Nixon with the war driving the, driving the world insane. And so when Coach had to come down to the jailhouse and get me out, oh, he was livid. Oh, my gosh. But when I gave out that number, my, he never changed his number. <laughs> he, he, he waited it out. He, he, wait, he had to wait about three or four weeks before oh. the calls stopped coming. Oh. And then they just said, okay, he's not going to pick up. Oh, wow. I love your stories. Do you have any of Luke, Richard, and Channing? One good one that you can share with our listeners? Yeah, well, they would always, you know, I'd he call them. He kicked me out of his house multiple times. No, I never did that, Richard. <laughs> he says that Luke, all the time. Luke, that you did. Luke, I did kick out. <laughs> and I was with Luke. <laughs> I got pneumonia, sorry. So I would call over there at school when they were there in Tucson. I'd call them up just to check on them. And, and they'd always say, Dad, Dad, Bill, I can't talk right now. I'm in church. <laughs> oh, good. This is great news. I'd call back the next day. Dad, damn it, Bill, I can't talk right now. I'm in the library. <laughs> and, oh, my gosh. And then I would go over there, and I would see all these, you know, beautiful angels walking around in their bikinis and their shirt cut off jeans, right? And everything just hanging out everywhere, and these angels just walking. And they said, oh, I was with Luke and Richard last night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. It was just incredible. Oh, man. And, but w- one of the things about Luke and Luke is a lot like me. He's very quiet and he's very shy and very reserved. And so here it was. As the children would go away to college, we'd always, Lori and I would just write them a check and say, here, you're going to have, have some, you know, some spending money. And all the other ones, all the other boys, Adam and, and, and Nate and, and Chris, they would say, this is fantastic. Let's go. And I'd hand Luke this check and Luke would look and say, oh, dad. That's too much, man. I, I don't need that much. And he, I said, it's okay, Luke. Just take it. He said, no, Dad, that's just way too much. Please. Aww. Just, uh, it's, I, I got it covered. And it was very much like when I went, <laughs> it was very much like when I went to UCLA. I was, I had the time of my life there. I was always hungry at UCLA, <laughs> but never for very long. <laughs> <laughs> well, UCLA, what a place. Oh. oh, my gosh. And I was just there. I've been able to go there back as the con as the broadcaster for the Conference of Champions. And it's just incredible what they've done with that school. And really all the schools in the Conference of Champions. And and I'll take this moment to say that Richard Jefferson, one of the very first athletes in in the history to, while he's a current player, write a large, large check back to his alma mater. And and they have the Richard Jefferson Gymnasium right there, right on Campbell Drive. Man, you drive by, <laughs> right, going to McHale, which is not named after Kevin McHale, no. But the Richard Jefferson Gymnasium, and that's what makes – me so proud <laughs> because <laughs> that, uh, that willingness, that, the, that understanding, because when you get old and when you're just in the way and you don't, can't do anything anymore, the driving emotions in your life are always pride, gratitude, and loyalty. Pride, the satisfaction with your choices in life. Loyalty, do you care? Does any of this matter? And then gratitude, the acknowledgement, the respect, the appreciation, and the gratefulness of the people who have gone before and all the people who have given me the greatest life ever. And now to see Richard, who's just a young man, I mean, 37 years old? Yeah, 36, 36. 36. I'll you're, be 37 you're, in June. Luke's older than you? No, no, no. Yeah, He's, Luke, Luke's a month and a half older than A month and a half older. Yeah, I thought yeah. you guys were twins. No. Man, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to go back and tell Lori. He's are in you Mar- sure that Luke and March, Richard are not He's twins? in March. I'm in June. March 28th. Yeah. yeah. What's his address? What's uh, his phone uh, number? Oh, you, 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 want to, you want me to put that out there? I don't think he would like that. I will say he's on Gates. Oh, <laughs> my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What city is that? Oh, I don't know. One I live in Mars, cities. man. I Mars. came back here from oh. the Mars Hotel. I've had a fantastic time here, man. I didn't think it was going to be. I, I was wondering if I had to bring my passport. Man. I didn't know. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna take me to a black site, and they're going to deport me. Oh, my gosh, please. I'm guilty. Yes, I'm guilty of smiling on a cloudy day. I'm guilty of being a fan of LeBron James. I'm being guilty of being a, a fan 
and an alumni and a proud member of the NBA. Wow. We're the luckiest people on earth, Richard. Honor. Who would have ever thought? Hey, honor. I mean, how's the yoga studio the doing? The yoga studio's great. <laughs> uh, Luke took the entire Laker team to the – because we just opened up – To the up yoga a, studio. To the yoga studio. We opened up a second one. The first one in Hermosa Beach was doing so well. We opened you up – You opened a second we one. We opened huh? a second one in downtown L.A., and Luke took the entire In downtown. Team in downtown. Wow. You know, it's, it's coming up. I thought, so, I thought it was just a place where you got to meet girls and nah, stuff, like sh- the Playboy Mansion <laughs> South. Well, no, I, you're I, married. I, I will say that. this. I decided to open up a yoga studio when I was single, okay. and then I got married. Yeah, and your wife like, is well, an angel. She's a wow. sweetheart. She's the yeah. best. But so, no one's an angel like Lori. Oh, no, my gosh. Lori's the best. Lori. Tell, Lori. Tell Lori Can I you imagine hello. being married to me? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, that Bill. poor girl. She's the best. Oh, my She's gosh. The best. Well, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I know Richard Jefferson, and I was here in Cleveland tonight. <laughs> wow. What and a you team. saw Game 7 when he won the championship. Oh, yeah, my gosh. Yo, Kyrie, so – one of the very few angles that they show, they have the up top, the side, right, but right. there's one where they show you because really? you were right by the Warriors right by, bench. Right behind so the Kyrie bench. So Kyrie shoots it. Your hands are up, and you're like, They're oh, gonna, my right, God. The Warriors are going to win. I'm a warrior of the Golden State. And then they're within. They're within. Like, oh, my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and then LeBron, right after that, LeBron blocks the Eagle Dollar <laughs> shot. But oh. it never would have happened had it not been for J.R. Smith making those three oh, points yeah. to start the second half. Eight points oh. to start the second start half. The second oh. half. Man, I mean, Swisher. I oh. remember. Oh. I remember as a player that start of the second half in Let's these go. games. Let's go. The referees, no whistles. Let's let them go. <laughs> You're just fighting, and it's just Wonderful, and there was Jr. setting the tone, man. <laughs> three Bam, quick, three one. in a and row. We were down. I was right there. Yeah, yo, I, and I, that's why I try and tell people it was like we were down right. eight at halftime emotionally. You're like you want to cry. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> Jr. just hits a bunch Let's of threes. Go. We Come go up, me. we go up the seven. You're like yes. Yeah. Then the next thing you know, it's tied, and you're like, what's going wow. on? Tied for a five wow. minutes. Yeah, it's tied. It's back <laughs> and forth. Crazy. But you held them to 89 points. You deserved to win. You were the better team. You had the better players. Yeah. And, and Ty Lu did a. Phenomenal job, and I love his on-court demeanor. Yeah. I mean, oh, I, I, I love these guys like Ty Lue, who comes from Mexico, Missouri. I mean, I mean, I live right next door to Mexico. I mean, we got to build. <laughs> 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 and I didn't think Missouri was anywhere near Mexico. Well, that's where he's from, man. But we got to build bridges and not walls out there. And here's Ty Lue. He gets this golden opportunity. And they make the decision here to get rid of David Blatt, who's now in Turkey, I believe. I mean, can you imagine being in Turkey right now? Oh, jeez. <laughs> anyway, so Ty Lu comes in. He gets this fantastic opportunity, and he handles it with such dignity and such grace. And I love the coaches who just sit over there on the <laughs> sideline and who just do their communicating because the players are all crazy enough, right? <laughs> you don't need to have the coach crazy. You need to have the coach be the calm guy who can say, okay, now this is what we got to do here, guys. And then he can look at LeBron, and he can look at Kyrie, and he can – Look at Kevin Love and Tristan and you and Channing and now Kyle Korver and, and give him a rational explanation of finding the path forward. And it's just absolutely spectacular. I'm so happy for him and so proud of him. And I was in his, I was in his office before the game tonight doing the coach's interview, right? And right behind his desk, there was this big giant poster of the championship parade and celebration, <laughs> right? And half your team had no clothes on. <laughs> it was a hot day, Bill. I was so jealous. I mean, I wanted some of that. Where's my uh, bike? Oh, where I, is my bike? I remember your championship parade. I rode my parade. bike to the championship parade in Portland, and uh, uh, it was like going into the Grateful Dead parking lot, right? <laughs> and it was just, I got separated from my bike, and I had no way home. And so when I got to the stage, I said, hey, where's my bike? And I didn't get it back. <laughs> <laughs> I did get it back, Where's but it took two bike? or three days. It took a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I hitchhiked home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. How, how was the parade in Boston? Oh, over the top. <laughs> 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 over the top. So in Portland, when the mayor, who was the master of ceremonies, uh, you know, he, he was uh, – coming up and then asking me to say a few words. And I'm a lifelong stutterer, so I couldn't speak at all in those days. And so here it was. They give me the microphone. I ask for my bike, and somebody passes me a beer. And I take the beer and take a big swig of it. Who knows who had already been drinking it, right? <laughs> and then I took the beer and I poured it over the mayor's head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was a great friend, and so he was all having the party too. And, yeah. and then we get to Boston, and the – 
you have to understand, Rafa, that when I when I was in Portland, Portland was an expansion team when we got there, and it ultimately became one of the great franchises in the history of the NBA. It's had all kinds of records, was the model, the economic model of success in this magical mystery tour that's the NBA. And then when I get to Boston, but Portland was a very small town. When I lived there, the, the town, the, the city of Portland had 250,000 people in the whole town. The entire state of Oregon, which is, a, which is, I think, the ninth largest state in the country. The entire state of Oregon, when I was there 43 years ago, was 350,000 wow. people. There were more people on campus every day <laughs> at UCLA than there were in the entire state of Oregon, right? So the entire state comes, 350,000 people, to this phenomenal parade and celebration of happiness and joy and everything. Boston, we get there, Boston's a really big city. Three and a half million people came to the parade there. And so we're up on these big military assault vehicles and we're (laughs) having to push the crowd back with the dogs and everything and police out in front pushing them away. And so the fans, they're throwing everything up into the truck, (laughs) you know, you name it. Drinks, <laughs> things we can't talk about in Ohio, <laughs> women's lingerie. It was all coming back and forth, right? And so I got a beer that somebody had just passed me, and I'm drinking this beer, and Chief's got one, and Kevin's right there. We're having the time of our life. And the little general manager, <laughs> the guy whose only job on earth was to add zero to Larry Bird's contract, right? He comes up to me, and he looks at Chief, and looks at Kevin, and he says, guys, I don't know. We're the Boston Celtics. I'm not really sure this is the right place okay, for you guys yeah. to be drinking beer. And I looked at him. <laughs> and I said, are you kidding me? This is what we live for. And I took a big sip of the beer, and I poured the rest of it over again. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. There. But Richard has asked me that when I do come to Cleveland that I don't pour beer on anybody else's head. No, no. Not until the championship okay. right next year. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be tough. But it's going to be very you got tough. a chance. We got you a got chance because we have LeBron James. All you can do is ask for that chance. Yeah. And just stay healthy. Healthy, keep the game fresh. Keep passing that ball. Wow, what a special deal! I'm so happy for you, Richard. <laughs> I love you, Richard. Oh, I love you, Bill. You're the best. You're the best. So, Thanks for my life. Hey, Bill. Thanks for my dreams. I, I am. Look, I Thanks know how this goes, Bill. I'm kicking you out of here. Oh my God! You gotta go. What time is my flight? Uh, <laughs> I, got, I have a 7 a.m. flight, and I haven't even packed yet. I'm going back to California. Where are you going, Bill? I don't know. I, I think I'm going to Mars. <laughs> You're going to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> no. You could stay. There. I'm actually going to one of the coolest places in the world, Seattle. Seattle, Ooh, and great town. Uh, you know, that, that is a place that's standing up for America. And uh, so, please, everybody, say a prayer. God help America. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Okay. Thanks okay. for having me, Rafa, Thank Ali, you so much. RJ. Yeah. Look at how cool this is. <laughs> Let's have a grand time. The celebration is underway. What a night. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. with that, it is road tripping with RJ and Channing off the beaten path with our host, the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only Bill Walton. There was a path tonight? <laughs> there was I'm no your, path. That's why I said off the beaten path. <laughs> a long, strange trip. Oh, like here we thing. go. Good night. All right. Night.